fertilizing the soybeans. Uh, these guys grow and multiply like crazy. So these are these are kind of some of the common ones that, that you'll find. So the other thing, once the prior and the bottom, that you really have to pay close attention to are uh, sort of the, the first two in particular. So temperature uh, probably shouldn't. Ideally, it should be around 20 degrees Celsius. Um, it, it'd be nice if it didn't get over 25. Sometimes it does. Um, but uh, anything over that, it can start to have negative effects on survival. Um, dissolved oxygen, um, ideally, it should be up around 8 or 10 milligrams per liter. Um, Monitoring oxygen and, and watching oxygen levels uh, morning and night is, is, is absolutely critical in determining whether you should be fertilizing or not. So if you're, if you're tracking it, um, first of all, your lowest oxygen readings are going to be first thing in the morning because all the plant growth and algae growth is, that's in your pond uh, produces oxygen during the day and then it consumes oxygen during the night. And in the morning, first thing in the morning is when you're going to see your lowest oxygen readings. So if you're, so we take a reading at 8 a.m. in the morning and 1 p.m. in the afternoon, and we're watching it all the time. So if you start to see a downward trend over a three or four day period after you've fertilized, and you're getting close to uh, around four or five parts per million or milligrams per liter, you may want to consider stopping uh, not fertilizing, you're doing your se second application that week is what's probably going to happen is once you fertilize again, that production of algae and phytoplankton is going to continue and you're, you're heading for a pond crash. Um, the walleye can, they can handle down around uh, 3 parts per million or 2.8 I think it is. But if you go anything below that, you, you probably have lost just to go to everything. So, um, so having, I'm not sure if everyone has one or not, but having one of these is, is probably one of your most valuable tools. And they're about 800 bucks. Um, so this does have a turn on. So if you're looking to spend your half your money, I would definitely really should have one of these. So this, this data sheet is, is an example uh, of some of the information. This, this sheet is, you can kind of see at the top, it's just for one day. So every day we'll make a new sheet um, recording, you know, if you fertilize, how much you fertilize, oxygen temperature. Um, taking note of the weather is another, um, is another good idea because it can help you determine what happened. And if you collect this same data year after year, you'll, you'll start to see trends um, and you can start to make decisions not only based on oxygen temperature, but on the weather as well. Uh, draining and harvesting, we talked a little bit about that. Um, we lower our ponds down. There's, there's a valve at the bottom end. Uh, we lower it down so that we can walk in with waders. Um, we have to be very careful because the screen size at the bottom end is that same screen size. So if you've got algae in there at all, and you're monitoring down there, block of screen and bust, and then you can lose everything. Um, so we drain it down low enough uh, to get in there. And if there is algae, we have to go in there and physically rake it out. Um, I understand there are some chemicals that can help you control algae, but again, um, it's costly. We don't like handling chemicals anymore. We have to, so we just do it manually to rake it all in. Yeah, did you want to mention insect control? Insect control? We don't do it. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what you mean. Well, well we have those uh, <coughs> white water bugs for one thing. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we, we don't do anything, but some of these, I don't have a picture of it. Um, and I'm not sure the name of them, but they're like a white, light green beetle. Um, I, I, I can't remember the name of them, but often we'll get thousands and thousands of them. So what happens with those little guys? As we're harvesting, they 
they they avoid us when we're raking the algae out, so they're left in the pond when we're harvesting the walleye. And when we're bringing them in, these little guys they'll latch onto whatever they're near, and they'll actually uh, they'll pinch them. And um, any what we found is any walleye that gets pinched once by one of those, it's almost like a sting, and they're they're dead. So um, so when we're draining it down, um, like I say, they're they're kind of one of the last things that are left, and we'll try to get. Um, avoid them when we're saving um, or try to net them off but those are kind of the bugs that we've had to deal with. Where would you? What's that? Where would you be able to? No, they're like a back swimmer. For a water yeah. bowman? Yeah. 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 yeah, I think they are. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of times you sold them because you think they're eating the live fried or eating summer as well. And they apply apply vegetable oil or diesel oil on top of the Yeah, so I, I, we've never done that, but yeah, we have experienced them in there. I don't, I don't know, I don't know what effect they've had on our fish, right? With the exception of, of that harvest, we know um, when we harvest, we bring them inside and put them in a tank. We can see all the ones that have been stuck. Um, you know, we can see the mark on them, and they turn, they turn black. Well, I'm right. So um, I guess all I can say to that is if you can uh, if you can get rid of them during harvest, um, that'll help. But as far as them predating on walleye fry during the process, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Question? Yep. Yeah. Have you ever had a problem with uh, like frogs, like tadpoles and crayfish? Because um, our pond is a nightmare. Yeah, not crayfish. We get thousands of tadpoles. Yeah. Uh, we don't have any crayfish, thankfully. I've seen them in other ponds. Yeah. It's like suffocating when you're trying to right. net. Yeah. Um, and the crayfish, again, we've seen them with walleye, like. Yeah. Pinched. Yeah, pinched. I, I, I don't know what to say to that. I don't know how you deal with that. We put up a frog fence, like a, like a screen around the fence that's existing to try yeah. to keep any migrants out. And over the years, we've cut the numbers down, but it doesn't take too many frogs to really get the tadpole numbers up. I and mean, yeah. trying to bleed through all them to get the fry out is, especially Sometimes. in the heat of summer, is really stressful. So, what are the frogs and tadpoles doing, and what do you think they're doing to the? It's just the numbers it's the of the tadpole. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oxygen, yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about aeration, um, so that can help uh, limit that issue. If that's if that's what's happening with the frogs, if they're consuming oxygen, then. then and we do it, right? We do have yeah. 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 And you have oxygen issues with that? No. No. Um, for us, and again, maybe we're lucky, but the timing is such that, that just prior to uh, us harvesting, most of the tadpoles, I think they're toads, is what they are, but most of them grow eggs and they're, they're in the grass. And unfortunately, they get run over by the lawn. <laughs> um, but yeah, I know what you mean because there's thousands of them. Yeah. Um, we don't do anything with that. I know a blue jay, um, they will go around and catch the frogs and get rid of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, crayfish, I have no idea what to do there for you. Sorry. <laughs> um, for, for our, the water coming into our <coughs> ponds, we actually put a, put a box screen on the inlet as well. Um, because we're drawing water from the lake, there, there are fish populations in the lake. Um, so anything that come, could come down through our line gets caught in the box. So that keeps any predation out. So if you've got a, a, an inlet where there's a possibility that things are coming in that you don't want to, you may want to put some kind of a screen on your inlet. How do you keep that going? Brush it daily, twice daily. Yeah. Yeah, it's a mess. It's a lot of work. Uh, so yeah, you guys are all familiar with some of the equipment that you need to inventory them. Um, for us, when we're hauling them out, we'll, we'll sing them up and we'll put them into just kind of big wide those metal wash basins and we'll throw them on a little four-wheeler trailer and we'll stick some air stones and we run them up as quickly as we can into our building and dump them into a large tank of fresh water. Um, what we found is if we get our kind of hands in there, kind of separate the muck and slop and stuff like that and kind of kind of leave it and put shade boards at the top end where the water's coming in, they'll all swim up towards that top end. 
and then we can kind of pull the swap down and get it out of there. Yeah, shade, the, shade, the shade boards seem to really help with a lot of different things. So before I go on to sort of the advanced room, is there anything else you want to talk about with the pond phase or egg collections or eggs or fry inventories or um, everyone knows how it's again it's important to get a good handle on what you pulled out of your pond um, so you know nets and a, and a decent set of weigh scales uh, is pretty important um, every every pond that we pull out they end up going into eight or nine tanks and we'll do three three sample counts on on every tank so we get a really good uh, average of the average size per fish and then we'll weigh all the fish out of that pond um, into another tank or into a stocking vehicle and then they're stocked. But it's important, obviously it's important to know what you got out of that pond. It's important to know what died during the harvest so that you can make changes if you have a lot of mortality during the harvest. Um, but it's also important to know, you know what your overall survival was for that pond. And then you can maybe trace it back if you stock you know, newly hatched fry or 24 hour hatched fry and what was the outcome. What, what is a good survival rate? Like what would you achieve? What ours, we've had ranges anywhere from zero to 110 <laughs> percent, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but but generally, uh, we expect uh, about 60 percent survival out of our ponds. That's an average year. So we put in something like 320,000 fry in all four of our ponds. And we get out, uh, or I think it's somewhere around 170 or 180,000 um, summer pond fingers. So, again, for uh, for every situation is different. I know when some people feed uh, uh, minnows to their to their uh, fry as a sort of supplement or getting bigger, um, we can't we can't feed our fish minnows because of the whole disease uh, concern for us. Um, if we start bringing in minnows from all over, all over different locations, we can be bring, bringing in diseases, and then we stock our fish, and we have no way of knowing what we've done. So it's a bit of a risk. So the reason I'm saying that is because we only raise our fish to about the half gram size, which is really this big. Um, so then, of course, your numbers are going to be, you can expect a little higher survival to that stage, because as time goes on, survival is going to go down. So how many varieties did you put in your... Uh uh, it, well, in all four of them, the some are around 320,000, but the, the, the seed... And you had uh, six million eggs? Is that what you were saying? We collected six and a half million eggs. Uh, a bunch of fry went to Hamilton Harbor. Um, some of them went to our intensive trials, and then some of them went into our ponds. Yeah. Um, but the seeding rate is 40 fry per cubic meter, and that's what we use. So all four of our ponds are slightly different in size. So they all get a different number of fry. How many days do you keep them in the pond? Uh, it's about 35 to 42 days for us. Uh, so advanced rearing, I won't spend a lot of time on this unless people want to know more about it, but basically um, when we harvest our ponds at that size and they're around half a gram, uh, a portion of them will bring them inside and we'll start feeding them an artificial diet right away. Um, the remainder of those will get stocked. And because some of the brood stocks were developing, developing at the hatch, we were getting less and less space to actually do this advanced rearing phase. But anyway, the process there is um, we'll take some of our pond, some of our from the ponds, put them in tanks, um, we'll start introducing artificial diet, and they'll be getting fed about every five minutes. And so we're kind of constantly keeping food in front of their face all the time. Some will still cannibalize, some will decide not to eat and, and starve to death. So our survival at that point, or from that point on, we, again, we can expect around 50 to 60% survival. Um, so you know, basically half of them will die or each other. So any of the cannibals, we try to pull them out if we can catch them, um, because they'll knock your numbers down pretty quick. And that's a fish meal to tell it? It, it is. Uh, there's a couple of ones that uh, work really well, but they're hard to get. And the one, the one that seems to work the best so far is one called Otahimi. 
the Japanese diet. It's really expensive and uh, you need a special permit to get it. I know there's some companies will, that will sell it in small quantities, but it's anywhere from 30 to $50 a kilogram. So it's really expensive. And that's a sinking pellet. It is, it is. Now the Otohimi one is kind of a slower sinking one. It's, it's, it's a little bit lighter. It's not a floor, <laughs> but it does sink. But it's not as heavy as some of the trout diets that we use. Um, but the, the goal there is to use as little of that as you possibly can, because obviously it's expensive. So if you can get them started on an artificial diet and then switch them over to a cheaper one, um, that seems to work really, really well for us. So we actually switch them over to our, our EWAS diet, which is a standard trout diet that you can buy anywhere. So that's kind of advanced, that's basically advanced rearing. Um, those, the tanks you see in the background, those are 4,000 liter cones. We put about 7,000 on summer fingerlings in there. And we expect somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 of those to survive. Once they're on the diet, they're fine. We've got fish, we've got, well, there's well, there's well over 10,000 bird stock we have right now. But the oldest ones are, they're old sixes, so they're like nine years old. So I guess my point is there, once they're on diet, you can get them on a cheaper trout diet. Um, they don't cannibalize anymore, and mortality is virtually nothing. Um, at our station, they grow really slow through the winter because their temperatures get down to about two degrees all winter long. They do really well in the summer. You follow up on if, um, if you release them? Yeah, so... So most of the ones that we pull out of the ponds are, are stock, and, that, and that's primarily because we don't have any space inside anymore. Um, the ones that we convert to our official diet will grow to that same fall, so towards the end of October. Um, we'll get them up to about six inches, anywhere from 15 to 20 grams. And then they're, stu they're stocked. Um, we do a fin clipping program on those, so we know that they came from our hatchery. So, so some assessment can be done on those ones. Um, we don't fit with the pond summer fingerlings because they wouldn't be able to handle it. They would all die. So that, so that's kind of the cycle for those guys. So collections, collections mid mid April. Um, pond summer fingerlings come right around the Canada Day, I think, or just after the Canada Day weekend, and then we grow some to the fall towards the end of October, and they're stocked. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you do any fall fingerlings in the pond, or is it all? No, no. Um, again, we, we've, we've got nothing to feed them, sort of past that half gram stage. At that half gram stage, they've eaten everything that's in the pond. And we're confident that they're going to start to cannibalize. So you'd have to suffer with fat in or something? Something. And, we, and as I mentioned, because of the disease concerns, we can't do that. So we either have to bring them inside and feed them artificial diet, or get them out. Do many hatcheries here raise past the summer fingerling stage? We have, man. Yeah. And that was a thousand ponds? Yeah, we had access to a <coughs> golf course pond, and we would put a thousand in there uh, about the 10th of July or 15th. And by mid mid September, we did the work for six, seven, eight inches long. And, but it was full of minnows to start with them. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, it's good if you can do it. Um, it's, a, it's a relatively inexpensive way of doing it, and you can get really big fish really quickly. That's for sure. It's hard to say. Pardon me? They're hard to say. Yeah, they're, they're fast. Yeah. Getting the flyer up. Okay. Um, just while I got that photo up, these feeders here uh, work really well. They're a programmable feeder, and every feeder runs off a of main panel, but every feeder can can be programmed to feed a different amount at different times and all kinds of neat stuff. So it's basically that white circle in the center is like a drum and there's different cup sizes so it rotates and it picks up food from the hopper and spins around and dumps it underneath. So it accurately measures feed and dumps it very consistently. So, so this feeding system is one that we're also going to use in our intensive trials which is really important to feed consistently and frequently. Uh, so, so on to intensive rearing. Um, so, intensive rearing is basically taking newly hatched fry or 24-hour fry, putting them in tanks and feeding them artificial diets right away with no other live food at all. 
Um, so this is our room that we were setting up last spring. Um, again, this was part of the scram the scramble last spring. We I don't know what the date is on this picture, but I can tell you it's very close to the end of May, and we're expecting to try and so we're scrambling to get it all plumbed in and ready to go. That. Um, so um, this Rathbun method that I'm referring to, there's a fellow in the U.S. named Alan Johnson, and he's going to be giving a talk in February towards the end of March. Um, and he's kind of one of the leading experts on intensive culture of walleye. Um, so we've we've been talking with him quite a bit, trying to trying to get all of his ideas and incorporate it, incorporate them into our own system here. Um, but it, it, if you're feeding them artificially to a certain stage and then stocking them, how do you know that they'll adapt to whatever they're stocked in? Because they're not going to get more color. Well, that's a, that's a good question. I do have an answer to that one. And so uh, a, couple, a few years ago, um, actually it's not quite the same thing, but it's, it's close. It's close I can get. We, we took some of our ponds, some of our fingerlings, brought them inside, converted them to an artificial diet, which they were on for, what's that, four months or so, three months. So they've been fed entirely, almost entirely on this pelican diet. And, and someone had said that, said, you know, you're putting these fish and they've been trained on pellets, how are they ever going to survive? They were going to expect a pellet to drop in front of their face. So we said, okay, well, let's try that. So we had some surplus whitefish that were just little guys. And we put we put a bunch of them in that tank, and with, within a day they were all gone. So my 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 theory or my opinion is that you're not gonna you're not gonna breed that millions of years of instinct of a walleye to eat live food out of them in a few months. I, I don't believe that. Like you said, you mark them too, eh? Before you send them. We do, yeah. So mm -hmm. have you had any come back growing them whatever? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. That, that's the best answer I can give to that. The reason we're trying this um, is that there's a high demand for walleye in there, as you probably know. Um, ponds are a limitation. You can only do so much. You can only get so many out of it. If we can grow more to bigger sizes on pellets, um, it might alleviate some of that some of that pressure. So, I mean, we know we know that some onnets. Um, you know, people who have been growing some on and hatcheries for, for centuries. And um, they've been fed entirely on, on diets for 18 months of their lives in, most, in a lot of cases. And we know that those pro some of those programs are successful. They, they eat live food right away. Um, and, and, and again, I know it's not the same thing, but we are perpetrator in our hatchery system for 18 months. Um, I've gone to this Rose Lake near Zambia, Near that knows that area, but Rose Lake. Put them in within within minutes. They're jumping at uh, at uh, the black flies because the black fly hatch was hatching at for happening at that same time. So instantly they're eating, jumping out, eating live food. So I can't see why a walleye would be any different. Um, so so for this intensive system, um, flow patterns are fairly important to kind of keep them moving around. Um, a highly palatable diet is also important. So that Otahimi diet that I referred to comes in smaller sizes. Um, that's one of the ones we're working on. And there's a couple other ones that we're trying to work on because uh, one, the cost is high for the Otahimi diet. Uh, the other is that um, at some point, the federal government may say, you guys can't have any more of this because they're the ones that control um, beans coming into Canada. Um, so we want another alternative diet that actually works on these guys. So we're trying other diets. Uh, turbidity is important. So um, you can see that blue tank in the back corner. That's a that's our clay slurry tank. So we'll add a clay which is not kale, and it's called the uh, Old Mine Number no. Four Kentucky Ball Clay. And you can buy it at any pottery shop. And so we'll mix up a slurry, and that big power head in the back is like a big impeller, so it keeps the slurry mixed up. And then we've got a periscopic pump that is adding that slurry into our main header tank in the other room. And then with, with the water that comes to all the tanks, it's, it's distributed that way. And so if we keep it at a certain turbidity, and I think it's somewhere between 50 and 70 NTUs. So it's just a, a measurement of turbidity. Um, and what that does, it kind of limits 
it limits their vision a little bit, and, and according to the RAF fund method, it, it re helps reduce cannibalism, um, and, it, and it helps uh, it helps um, get them onto diet quicker. Um, the other one. And then there's you can't they're not in this picture yet, but we've got spray bars strung along there because. Um, when walleye fry and hatch, they're so small that they can't break the surface tension of the water to get out the food. So the spray bar breaks the surface tension of the water and allows them to eat food. And actually pushes the food down a little bit as well. Um, but it's, uh, this whole system is very labor intensive. It requires a lot of constant supervision and constant cleaning and feeding and monitoring because uh, another issue of course is cannibalism. So any cannibals you see gotta pull it if you can catch them. Anything more on that? The uh we use for lighting to get the lights on it or do you yeah. keep it fairly dark? Um there is a recommended light level and I can't remember what that number is either. But we've got and they're not in this picture but there's gimmable LEDs in the ceiling we can dim them down. We can pull the light up. Um, we're not really thoroughly convinced that it plays that much of a role yet, but we're not uh, you know we're not arguing with the rap on that they've got some recommended levels so we try to go with that until we get comfortable and then we may start making our own adjustments. And then brine shrimp, do you incorporate brine shrimp? We don't do any brine shrimp for these guys. Uh, as I was talking to you earlier, we do, we are doing or feeding brine shrimp to our bloggers for Deepwater Cisco. Um, that's a whole other uh, fairly intensive uh, culture of little organisms, and now you're growing organisms to feed other organisms. Um, it, it can be costly and uh, it's, it's a lot of work as well. All I got. Yeah, like I say, I I, um, I I don't have all the answers. I I I know what seems to work for us, and yet um, every year when we think we got it all figured out, we get hit with another surprise. So I don't think it's uncommon to fall on that that you have good years and bad years. There's a lot of different uh, factors at play. Some of them are in our control and some of them are out of our control. Yeah. Do you stock these uh, root stock on regular lakes with wild wild in them? The bird stock? Pardon? The, the, do we stock the bird stock? Yeah. Um, What's your raising there? 